Welcome back to another video on Form 5 Biology. My name is Janet and I'll be teaching you the topics today. So let's study biology together. To receive notification of new biology videos, please click the subscribe button below to subscribe. Here are the learning outcomes for this lesson. After this lesson, we should be able to explain how a fish overcomes water resistance when swimming in water. Number two, explain the mechanism of locomotion in a fish. How does the fish swim? And number three, state the adaptations of the fish to move in its habitat. Let's look at a, a question that may be asked in the exam, an essay question. Explain the adaptations of a fish for locomotion. Or, it can be phrased this way, explain how a fish is adapted for movement in its habitat. Explain how a fish is adapted for movement in its habitat. Okay, so for these two questions, the answer can be written below. The questions are about the same. So the first thing we need to do is to explain the type of skeleton that the fish has. So fish are aquatic organisms with endoskeletons, a type of skeleton that's inside the body, internal, and is made up of bone or cartilage and is covered by the tissues. Number two, the type of locomotion. We must mention what is the mode of locomotion of a fish. So they move by swimming in water, swimming. Okay. Thirdly, what are the problems they face in water? So they face resistance when moving in water as water is much denser than air. So for people who know how to swim, they will experience this feeling when they swim in the water that it is much more difficult to swim through the water than to walk on land and face the resistance of air or wind okay because water is much denser than air and it will give more resistance to movement so to overcome water resistance and move more efficiently in water the fish has three adaptations that we must know Firstly, it has a streamlined shape to reduce water resistance. Say this with me, streamlined shape. This is an important concept. So if you look at a fish from the top, you will see that its shape is something like a drop of water, but from the top. Okay, it's narrow at the front, then it broadens somewhere near the beginning or the middle. And then it tapers and narrows to form a tip at the end. So this streamline shape is a special shape that reduces water resistance or even resistance in air. Even birds have this streamlined body shape. And man has copied this shape in the many inventions that can move on water or air. For example, aeroplanes have streamlined shape and so do ships or boats and submarines and torpedoes that move in water or in air. So all these objects have the streamlined shape copied from nature because this shape is most suitable to reduce water resistance. In the next part, we will discuss a little bit about the streamlined shape. Next, scales on the skin face backwards to reduce water resistance. If you look at a fish, we can we'll notice that the scales face backwards towards the tail. It opens up towards the tail. This is to allow water to flow through the body surface without getting trapped inside the scales. If the scales were to open up the opposite way, then the water will get trapped inside the openings of the scales and it will create more water resistance. So the scales must face or open up 
to uh, in backwards or facing the back okay not facing the front of the fish thirdly the body surface is covered in a slimy coating of mucus to reduce water resistance and friction so many fishes have a slimy coating which they produce from their cells to cover their bodies so that it's very slippery and it will help the water to flow on the surface very easily without much friction. So these are the three adaptations of the fish to overcome water resistance. Notice that it all start with S. Okay, water resistance, streamline shape, S, streamline shape, scales, face backwards, slimy coating of mucus. So you can use this as a memory aid to remember the three adaptations of the fish to overcome water resistance. Okay, 3S. We said that a fish has a streamlined shape to overcome resistance in water. Let's explain this more clearly. Let's say you have two shapes which you are moving by hand in water. Okay, one is a streamlined shape like this, like the like a, the shape of a fish, and the other is a block of wood or an object which is triangular in shape. Like a block of wood that's triangular in shape. This is the three-dimensional depiction of it. But in the water, looking from the top, it's like a triangle. Okay? So let's say you have your hand on this object and you're moving it along in the tank, a tank of water. Will you be able to move it with uh, difficulty or will it be easy to move it? So if you are trying to move this object, you'll find that there is a lot of resistance. Why is that so? You can see here that as you're moving the object forward this way, the flow of water is going to flow. The water will flow around the object. Right? But the water is unable to fill up the space at the back here. Because it is blocked by this part of the wood or the object. So this area is an area of low pressure. Low water pressure. And compared to the region in front which has higher water pressure so because of the difference in pressure there is a resultant force called the drag which pushes the block of wood backwards so triangular shape creates drag and drag is a resistance force pushing the shape backwards so this type of shape is not suitable for moving in water because drag will be created at the back pushing the, the wood backwards or the object backwards let's look at the streamline shape on the left now when this object or this organism is moving in water the water is flowing around the body and it will meet at the end here okay the water current on the left and the right will meet at the end here so this space behind the streamline shape has water too as much as the region in front therefore there is no area of low water pressure and the object is able or the organism is able to move forward provided it produces its own forward thrust or force to move it forward. It will not face the resistance or frictional drag that causes it to be pulled backwards. So this shape, the streamline shape here, is suitable for the object to move or the organism to move in water. We have already discussed three adaptations of the fish for movement. That is, to reduce water resistance, the fish has a streamlined 
body shape and the body is covered with scales that point backwards thirdly the body is covered with a slimy coating of mucus to reduce the friction of the water flowing around its body and to reduce water resistance next let's look at more adaptations of the fish for movement the vertebral column of the fish is in the center part of the body here it is very flexible and bends easily in order to allow the body here to bend and the tail to bend from left to right and right to left side to side so when the body and tail bends from side to side it's able to produce a forward thrust that moves the fish forward we will look at the movement in another part of this video so vertebral column is flexible the next adaptation is that the fish has muscles on the right and left side of its vertebral column these are called the myotomes let's repeat this word myotomes so we have myotomes on the left side and myotomes on the right side and the left and right myotomes are w shaped okay if you look here they have a shape or a pattern like w especially when you cut the upper part of a fish and cut it away you can see that there's a pattern there so the myotomes are found in as segments segments of muscles they are not just one single block of muscle okay so there are many myotomes on the left side and many myotomes on the right side the left and right myotomes are also called antagonistic muscles do you still remember the meaning of the word antagonistic what is the meaning of antagonistic muscles these are muscles that work in opposite ways when one contracts the other will relax okay and they will cause movement to occur in opposite ways we'll come to that in the next part here are two more views of the myotomes of a fish this one shows you the longitudinal section of the fish if you cut it on this axis and reveal the myotomes under the skin the shape of the myotomes is also like a w whereas this is the cross section of the fish if we cut through the body of the fish like this especially when we eat fish fillet we will see this pattern of the cross section of the fish so all these circular segments of tissues are the myotomes on the two different sides of the fish the right and the left side and this structure here is the vertebral column in the center so the picture of this uh, myotomes in this cross section in the cross section of the fish came out in the spm exam question just a few years ago so these are all myotomes let us now discuss the mechanism of locomotion in a fish it all starts with the myotomes first the myotomes on the left side contract the left side of the vertebral column here so these are the myotomes on the left side when they contract it means that they will become shorter and group together and become shorter now the myotomes on the right side will relax at the same time so when myotomes on the left side contract they will shorten this part of the body and so the tail will be swept to the same side as the myotomes that means tail moves to the left you can see that this line here is shorter than this line here okay because myotomes on right side are relaxing but the myotomes on the left side are contracting so it makes this part of the body shorter and it pulls the tail to the left so the tail will go the same side as the myotomes that contract okay right so now the tail has moved to the left as it sweeps to the left against the water 
there will be an opposite reaction of the water on the tail. So according to Newton's law, to every action there is an, an equal and opposite reaction. So as the tail acts on the water by pushing against it, the water will push back on the tail. This is the opposite reaction of water, okay, denoted by the red arrow. But this force from the water can be divided into a forward thrust and a lateral thrust. So it is the forward thrust that moves the fish forward, propels the fish forward. Okay, what happens to the lateral thrust is not mentioned and we do not have to mention it. Could be cancelled out by the action of the fins. But it's okay, just leave it alone. So these are the sequence of events that happen in the sweeping of the tail to the left and the production of the force called the forward thrust that propels the fish forward. Next. So for the first part of the mechanism of locomotion of the fish, we discussed what happens when the myotomes on left side contract. So after the forward thrust is produced, then the myotomes on the right side will contract instead. So if this happens, the myotomes on the left side will relax. So when myotomes on the right side contract, they will become shorter, the body will become shorter, and it will pull the tail to the right. So as the tail sweeps to the right in the water, the opposite reaction of water will be produced. And this force can be broken down to the forward thrust and the lateral thrust. So it's the forward thrust that propels the fish forward. Let's go through the mechanism of locomotion of fish very quickly. And you have to, you can write the notes down. Firstly, myotomes on the left side of the vertebral column contract and myotomes on the right side relax. So the tail will move to the left according to the myotomes which contract. If myotomes on left side contract, tail moves to the left. Then the tail pushes on the water and causes an opposite reaction of the water to be produced. This provides the forward thrust which propels the fish forward. Next, myotomes on the other side will contract, that is the right side, whereas myotomes on left side relax. So tail moves to the right as the myotomes on right side contract. Again, the tail pushes on the water and this produces an opposite reaction of the water, which then provides the forward thrust again to propel the fish forward. Thus, alternate contractions and of the left and right myotomes cause the body to bend from side to side, as seen here. Okay, as the body bends from side to side, first it bends to the left, then the right, the left, and then the right. Then the tail will also move from side to side, to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. And this produces forward thrust which propel the fish forward. We will use this diagram to show the different views of the fish. Firstly, if you are looking at the fish from this view, that means from the aerial view, looking down onto the fish, this is called the dorsal view because the upper part of the fish is actually the dorsal view. Just like a person who is crawling on the floor, the back is the dorsal view, looking at the back of a person. Now, if you are looking in front at the fish, fish's eyes here and the mouth, this is called the anterior view. And if you are looking from the back, it's called the posterior view. So if you are looking from underneath the fish, now if looking on top of the fish, it's the dorsal view. So if from underneath, it's called the ventral view. And if you look at it sideways, it's called the lateral view. 
We are now going to study the types of fins that are found on a fish. So if you look at the fish from this view, it's called the lateral view, the side view. And again, if you look from this front here, it's called the anterior view. If you look from the back, it's called the posterior view. If you look from the top, it's called the dorsal view. And from the bottom, it's called the ventral view. Why do we need to know all these views? Because the fins are named according to the views. For example, the top fin of the fissure is called the dorsal fin. Let's say together, dorsal fin, because you can see it from the top. And this big fin here that helps the fish to be propelled forward in movement is called the caudal fin or the tail fin. So try to remember both of the names, caudal fin or tail fin. Then below here, there's one fin, since we can see it from underneath, it's called the anal fin or the ventral fin. Okay, the anus of the fish is somewhere near here, so it's called the anal fin. But if you consider the view, viewpoint from the viewpoint, it's called ventral fin. So both names are also important to be remembered. Then there are a pair of pet fins. Here, a pair of fins called the pelvic fin. At the upper part, you have the pectoral fin, which are also pet fins. So they are called pectoral fins because they are like at the shoulder. Pectoral means the shoulder region. Okay, so the fish has two median fins. That means it's situated in the center of the body the dorsal fin and the anal fin, and uh, there's only one of each. The pet fins, we have two types, pectoral fins on the right and left side, and the uh, pelvic fins also on the right and left side of the fish. So it's important to remember all the fins and to be able to label them. Let's see how the fins of the fish help to overcome instability. Some of these movements cause instability and that is number one, pitching, number two, yawing, and number three, rolling. These are movements that cause instability. For example, if the fish is trying to move forwards in a straight line, it may have a tendency to pitch or to move up and down due to the moving water currents. So pitching is the movement that goes up and down, right? Up and down movement. To overcome pitching, the fish uses its pad pelvic, P for pelvic. So these are the pelvic fins below and the pectoral fins, P for pectoral, that is nearer to its head here. Okay, so how do the pad, pad pelvic and pectoral fins help to prevent or overcome pitching? For example, if the fish is pitching downwards and it wants to come up, it wants to come up so that it is in a horizontal position, then it must move its pectoral fins here downwards. As it moves its fins downwards, the opposite reaction of water will push it upwards. So if it's moving down too far down, it just moves the pectoral fins downwards and then it will come up. Okay, this is just an example of how pitching is controlled by the pectoral fins. Now for yawing, yawing is the movement, is a left and right movement, movement to the left and right instead of going straight ahead. So this is overcome by the dorsal and ventral fins. The fin that you see here the orange one is the dorsal fin and the ventral fin is below. For example, if the fish is yawing to the left here, then this dorsal fin must move more to the left too. As it moves to the left, the opposite reaction of water will push it back to the middle or to the center. Okay, so if it's moving too far to the left, the dorsal fin will move to the left too. And then the opposite reaction of water will 
push the fish to the correct position, which is in the center. And if it moves too much to the right here, then the dorsal fin must move to the right so that the opposite reaction of water will push the fish back to the center. Okay, so yawn is overcome by the dorsal and ventral fins. Rolling. Rolling is the movement in which the is a movement in which the fish turns on on an axis. Okay? Instead of being displaced from its position, it just turns around that position. So rolling rolling is overcome by the dorsal fin, ventral fin, pelvic fins, pectoral fins. That means almost all the fins except the caudal fin. Okay? Right, so remember pitching is overcome by pelvic and pectoral fins, the three piece. Rolling is overcome by all the fins except the caudal or tail fin. And yawing is overcome by the median fins. The fins in the center are called the median fins, dorsal and ventral fins. Let's go through these facts that we have just discussed. Fish use fins to overcome instability in water. Dorsal and ventral fins help to overcome yawing. Pectoral and pelvic fins help to overcome pitching. And C, both median and pet fins, that means the dorsal fin, ventral fin, pelvic fins and pectoral fins, all prevent rolling and act as stabilizers. Now another function of the pectoral fins is to help in steering the fish. That means it will help to the fish to move in a certain direction. As the pectoral fins are being moved, it will steer or turn the fish around or move the fish in a certain direction. So it acts like the rudder of a ship. Pectoral fins also act as brakes to stop the movement of the fish. So if you watch the fish in, the, in a fish tank or an aquarium, you can see that if they are moving very fast and going near to the wall, the pectoral fins will suddenly come outwards and act as brakes to provide more water resistance and stop the fish from going in the in that particular direction before they hit anything. Okay, so they act as brakes to stop the movement of the fish. Lastly, the swim bladder. The swim bladder is another adaptation of the fish. So what are swim bladders? Sometimes it's called air bladder. It is a sac in the abdomen which contains gas inside. And this gas can be removed or added on. So the swim bladder helps the fish to adjust its depth in water using the gas inside the swim bladder, which is uh, made up of oxygen and other gases. So if the fish wants to move deeper down, it will empty some of the gas so that it will be heavier and less buoyant. So when it becomes heavier, then it will sink downwards. Okay? So if it wants to float higher up, then it has to add some gas into the swim bladder to make it lighter. So the swim bladder is an organ that controls the buoyancy of the fish in water. Whether it is lighter and more buoyant or it wants to become less buoyant, and sink downwards. Okay, so the air in the bladder is adjustable. The amount of air or gas in the bladder is adjustable. 